on an all-new Dr. Phil. Are schools overstepping and trying to take the place of parents? Unbeknownst to us, she had come out to her teacher as transgender. You were the last to find out about this. Yes. I'm a psychiatrist. If the child could have gone to the parents, they would have. That's a big if. There are parents who are going to reject their identities. I want to debate that. Is this teaching children to lie? Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Get ready to take care of you. Well, it's season 21, and I'm sure you're noticing that audience members are actually up here on stage with me. So welcome, everybody, to being up here. This season, I resolved to find a way to make all of you an even bigger part of what we do here. I give you a more active voice in our discussions, and I can think of no better way than to bring our studio audience right up here on stage to participate in what is happening in real time. So let's just jump right in. A lot of questions today. Should transgender students be allowed to use the bathroom of their choice? Why are some schools asking for parental permission to give students pain relievers, but not alerting parents when their children want to change pronouns or gender identity? Many are asking why 1.4% of 13 to 17 year olds who identify as transgender are dictating the agenda for the remaining 98.6%. Are schools overstepping and trying to take the place of parents? Or are schools merely adapting to changing times, social norms, and the needs of students today? Now, my question is, is this inclusivity or is it, as some say, indoctrination? Take a look. Controversy tonight over a new policy on how gender identity is addressed in Utah school. This is stemming really from a lot of bullying that a transgender students and non-binary students have seen in Utah classrooms. It's a matter of life and death for trans students. There's a lot of studies that indicate that when chosen names and pronouns are used, suicidal attempts and self-harm decrease. A family's fighting for transgender rights at a Tucson middle school. The entire school year, the family's been fighting for access to the boys' bathroom. They say their son was offered access to a different option that's gender neutral. The nurse's bathroom is not convenient, and you may as well just put a big neon sign that says trans kid bathroom. The West Point School Board voted to terminate French teacher Peter Flaming because he didn't refer to a transgender student with male pronouns. He was really fired not because of anything he did, but because of something he wouldn't do. He wouldn't violate his faith. And the school district wasn't willing to compromise. This elementary school in Ventura County was hit with graffiti following a teacher's affirmation of a transgender student. Every student has a fundamental right to be safe in their place of learning. Megan Goebel is the mother of a trans second grader. If we don't give them the freedom to explore, if we tell them that these kinds of things are wrong, um, think about what that does to a child. It really crushes their spirit, crushes who they are. It makes them feel like they can't, you know, explore things outside of even just gender. Let me ask you, how many of you agree that it's okay for the school to do this outside the awareness of the parents? Okay, how many of you think, no, that's not a good idea. Parents need to be involved. <laughs> so most of you think the parents need to be involved. Right. Okay, Eli, you disagree, why? Well, I was one of those students. I came out very young when I was eight years old. And um, by the time I was in high school, my school administration wouldn't change my file to female. So while my driver's license was female, my permanent record was male. And I had to fight for it. And frankly, it was humiliating. People would see my file, call me a boy without even seeing my face or who I was. It was dehumanizing and really, it, it really made me feel like I was lesser than the other students. But the question was, why do you think it's okay to exclude the parents? 
Well, that's because sometimes parents don't agree. And all but sometimes they do. Absolutely, but that's not all the time. So can I just say something? Yes. My name's Astra. I'm a mom. And, you know, your situation was one in which the school system wouldn't honor your identity. And nowadays, the school systems are honoring the identity that the children want to embrace. There are secrets being kept from parents. Mm -hmm. And the best evidence of a child's success is parental involvement. And look at the audience, that we are on the side of having parents involved and not keeping secrets because ultimately we have to bring any parent along who may not have understanding. And I completely respect what you're saying in terms of the isolation and the rejection mm -hmm. that a parent may have. But ultimately when that child leaves the public school system, they are in that family. And that is for life. And so we need to keep bringing parents uh, in and keep them engaged. Osra, I, th I think we ultimately do have the same goal here. We do want parents to support their children. And we want that world in which parents can always be supportive of their child being trans or exploring their identity. But unfortunately, we don't live in that world. And there are parents who are going to reject their identity. We, we want to be aspirational. So we do not go to the lowest common denominator of society ever. We want to be aspirational. We want to have the experts, the professionals, Dr. Phil and, and you, Dr. You know, and others work with families then. Because we, and now the school systems, you know, the Biden administration has put billions of dollars now into the brain health of children because we want to uplift children. So. We should be aspirational yeah, and not go down. We should be to... working with parents to train them on gender identity issues. Right. But unfortunately, we're not there yet. Jennifer says she felt betrayed by her 10-year-old daughter's teachers and therapist. She says they went nearly three months calling her daughter by a different name and gender identity without her ever being notified. Yes, I think it was actually more than three months. Okay, how um, long? Well, it was September okay. uh, until February. At the beginning of the year, her teacher sent me an email. Um, and in this email, it used a, a name I didn't recognize. I actually thought uh, he got the wrong parent. <laughs> I went up to my daughter's room and <clears throat> I looked on her dresser and I saw that she had written this name and the words they, them. And I said, uh, do you have a new nickname? <laughs> it was actually kind of close to her name, but uh -huh. kind of androgynous. Uh -huh. And she said yes, and I didn't really think anything more of it. When my daughter was about nine or 10, she was experimenting with all these different identities, many different ones. And by the time she was in fifth grade, unbeknownst to us, she had uh, come out to her class and her teacher as transgender, as you know, she thought she was a boy. Okay. Um, we didn't know about this. Uh, a couple months later, and, and furthermore, uh, the adults were using male pronouns for her at school, and they never told us about this. Uh, when she broached the subject with you earlier, you didn't, like, freak out, punish her, ostracize her, kick her out, because that happens no. a lot with, with it? parents. It does, yes. The percentage of children that are transgender that are homeless is way more than it is for the general population because their families just don't react to it well. They wind up on the street and so therefore teachers might think, eh, you know, but they knew you, right? They you, did you know me. You worked as a homeroom mother. They knew you. I mean, they're, you were involved. They did know me. You'd think the therapist set you up as the enemy. Yes, she was creating a wedge between us and our daughter. Monday, I'm an American and I'm pissed off. The price of almost everything rising faster than in decades. I have to pay three, four, five times the price and then not get as much food. I just did a huge grocery haul. It was under $100. What is your recommended budget? This is a doable number. I think it's crazy. What you're doing is working, so I'm going to shut up. That's Monday. Then, on Tuesday... Danny was given a bottle of vodka taped to his hand. He was told to drink it. Finish it. Danny suffered massive brain damage, left blind, paralyzed, unable to communicate. That's Tuesday.
I don't trust professionals anymore. Not only was I betrayed by the school and by the therapist, but I have watched thousands and thousands of other families be betrayed in the same way. And I'm here to stop that from happening. Jennifer first shared her story with Independent Women's Forum and is here today speaking out about what happened, what she feels was totally behind her back. And there's much more to her story. You were the last to find out about this. Yes. And I even though the school knew you, you had said things to the school to let them know that you were certainly not the kind of parent that was going to punch your child, kick them to the curb. You weren't giving the earmarks of someone that was going to be really punitive or rejecting of your child. Never. Even at the beginning, and they still didn't include you. Yeah. Okay. And I'm sure the child had said to them that they were concerned about what your reaction would be? I I don't know. Well. That I, nobody told me. Yeah. A couple months into the school year, uh, I got a call from the counselor, and she said that my daughter used the words cutting and suicide. Right. Uh, and, of course, I was concerned. And I she sold to me the idea of using this special therapist that was contracted with the school. That and she had used these terms with another student, another child. Yes, okay, she and, did, right, and, and that got reported to the counselor. Right. Which to is the good, teacher. yes. And, the, and so they got you a counselor through the school. And then she recommended to me a therapist that was contracted with the school, that came into the school and would see children who were struggling with these issues. All right, and you saw the counselor half hour a week for two and a half months, and she reported, hey, nothing to report, no yeah, I asked her issue. several times. She didn't report right. anything. Uh, I thought nothing significant had been discussed. Okay. Um, and then right before the pandemic hit, I got a phone call, and this therapist was saying that, uh, was actually using male pronouns and this new made-up name for the first time. I had never heard her do this. Um, and I actually spoke to her uh, at the beginning because I knew she was, t like, exploring these identities um, and I thought she was too young to know but I made sure that she this therapist understood we, we would love her no matter what um, there's nothing that would make us you know reject our child right so then she calls you sets up this meeting and this is when for the first time you were told what had been going on yes um, uh, so I, I was actually I was pretty confused that I had never had heard anything about this from the therapist before this um, I was, I felt blindsided. And I also, you know, she gave us three days to process this and then she was going to have a, wanted to have a meeting with us and our daughter to help her come out to us as a boy. Okay. And you said you'd think the therapist kind of set themselves up as the savior. Yes, I do. I think that she, um, you know, she was kind of creating a wedge between us and our daughter and putting us up putting us in an adversarial position yeah. with our daughter. Set you up um, as the enemy. Yes. She also wanted us to know that she, that our daughter wanted to be in the boys' cabin uh, for fifth grade camp, an overnight camp. Mm -hmm. um, and that we actually had to give permission for that because our daughter was under 13. At 13, we likely wouldn't ev have even known that she was going to be in the boys' cabin. Okay. It became apparent to you that she had broached this at school mm -hmm. and the teacher there was a pact between your child and the teacher saying we'll keep this between us i don't, I don't want to tell my parents at this point i don't know that she said that ever i'm you not sure I, I actually don't think she said that i don't think she said well, whose don't decision tell my was it to not tell um i think it was the school's decision i think they were being very careful because they, okay. for whatever reason, they decided I might not be supportive. And let me ask you, Dr. Safai, if you have a child that has suicidal ideation yes. or homicidal ideation, exactly. do you not have an obligation okay, exactly. to exactly. include the parent? So, so what we're doing basically... Are, are you comparing being trans okay. to being suicidal or homicidal? I can't tell you how many people I've had say, oh, talk about this, but...
I'm going to talk about this, the national issue that every parent needs to pay attention to. The last thing he had to do to get into the fraternity was to drink a lot of alcohol. Well, one, what is your emergency? Oh, my God! Oh, my God! I resolved to find a way to make all of you an even bigger part of what we do here. And I could think of no better way than to bring our studio audience right up here on stage. This is a cautionary tale. They were like, get on webcam with me right now, or I'm going to send this to literally everybody you know. Customers seem to be losing their cool at the drop of a hat. What the hell is going on? It is the number one issue on everyone's mind. I'm talking about inflation. Oh boy, are we going to talk about that? Uh, introduce yourself, doctor. Yeah, I'm Dr. Safai. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist. I treat a lot of trans students. Um, I just want to say that if the child could have gone to the parents, they would have before going to a teacher. Now, whether it's fear of not being accepted or in some cases safety, they chose to go to the next best adult, which is the teacher. If you break that confidence, if you break that trust, the kid has nowhere to go. Now, this, you know, I understand your point of view, but the school doesn't know the dynamic of the family, right? What if the kid is actually in some sort of danger if they come out? That's a big if. They didn't give me any chance to give any input into what I thought was going on with my daughter. In fact, when I tried to say what I thought was going on and why this didn't actually make sense to me, because I know my daughter, you know, nobody, nobody loves our, our child more than, than her parents. Nobody has a stronger desire that, to have her grow up happy, healthy, and productive. Okay. And there's nothing that would make us reject her. And let me ask you, Dr. Safai, if you have a child that has suicidal ideation okay, yes. or homicidal ideation, exactly. do you not have an obligation okay, exactly, exactly. to include the parent? So, so what we're doing, basically... Are, are you comparing you, being trans okay. to being suicidal or homicidal? No, no. I'm, it, I, think, I think let's not misrepresent what I just said. What I said mm -hmm. is that you have a code of conduct okay, let me when it comes to minor that. children. Yes. And so why do we change the rules Let me when it comes that. to this issue? Whatever a child tells me in an examination room is confidential unless they're a danger to self or others. That is the only case that I have a duty to report to the parents. Right. Anything else that is said to me in an examination room is privileged. Well, the same thing should apply. Let me interrupt that for a second. That's only true once that child is 12 years old, correct? Right. Well, I, I mean, no, even if a five-year-old tells me something that's not a safety issue, uh, but wants to keep it in the exam. That's just simply not issue. correct. That's no. not correct. You, yeah. you don't have a doctor-patient confidentiality bond with a five-year-old child. If a five-year-old... And how many old five-year-old children pick up the phone and call and make an appointment with you? No, say I'm examining the kid in an examination room, and they tell me, oh, I feel like a boy lately. I have no duty to report that. Unless they tell me, you know, I've been feeling like a boy and it's really messing with my psyches and I'm having the suicidal thoughts, that 100% I have to report. And you said, are, are you e equating, like, homicide tendencies and suicide your, um... tendencies with, with, with transgender? The fact is, right. there is much higher risk among the transgender population for suicidality, both ideation and attempts, yeah. and the fact that her right. child had used suicidal terms with another child that had been reported does indicate that she yes. might be at risk at that point, which does indicate exactly. that she does have a duty to report yeah, that right. to the parents. It's, that's exactly what I'm so, saying. So, yes, no. that, it, that yeah, sometimes is involved. Is so you ask yes. that in then a yeah. condescending way, we but don't the answer with that. is yes. Because, because our concern is ultimately, everybody here can agree that our concern is for the well-being of the child, mm -hmm. right? Here's and, the thing. And so Being transgender wanna, doesn't make someone suicidal. Nobody is saying that, and that's not the assumption oh, being made. No, so it we doesn't shouldn't. make it, of course, but it is a higher risk. Right. We do have to take a break here, because i got to pay for these lights. All right, so... So, is this teaching children to lie? Is it teaching them to keep secrets? Is it teaching them to exclude their parents? And if they do it here, are they going to do it with something else? Are teachers providing a safe space for students outside their home for kids that need it? Because there are those who do. As I said, a lot of transgender uh, children wind up on the street. We'll talk about all that when we come back. This is a 
another installment in my series, The Secret to Turning Your Dreams into a... Parents all over the country are questioning why they have to give permission for their children to be given pain medication in school, yet they're not being told about their children's pronoun preferences or change in gender identity, which is a major path correction uh, in their life, and you would think parents would want to be involved in that. What I alluded to earlier is some parents don't handle that information very well. They get judged, rejected, kicked out of the house, physically, mentally, verbally abused, all sorts of things. But you don't know that. You, you, you just can't know that. Now, we've heard from some of our experts so far, but let me introduce them formally. Joining us is Astra, and pronounce your last name, please. Oh, my name is Astra Nomani. Okay. Yeah. And she is a mother and a parent advocate at Independent Women's Network. She believes schools have an obligation to inform parents immediately if a student shares information about their gender identity or anything else that involves their life path. Also joining us is Eli Ehrlich, co-founder of TSER, Trans Student Education Resources, an organization run by and for transgender youth. And also a psychiatrist and physician, Dr. Yalda Safai. Uh, they both say that student confidentiality is of the utmost importance. So thank you all for being here. And you've, we've already been talking some. And you and I were going back and forth, uh, Doctor, about where confidentiality lies. And some of this is practicality, not legality and you have to think about it i spent a lot of years in in practice and common sense has to prevail uh, first and my question is there's one thing about doctor patient confidentiality but i was reading your comments and i've looked at a lot of your videos online for a long time long before this is part of the reason we wanted you to be here because I have a lot of respect for your work. But you seem to think that there is a confidentiality bond between teacher and student as well. I mean, there legally isn't one, but there should be one, because ne after the parents, the next best adult a student should go to for advice, for help, if they're having any problem, is the teacher or the guidance counselor in a school system. So I'm saying there should be a confidentiality so a student has a safe place to go to. Well, people, this is my 21st year doing this, and I did over five years before that, and so for 26 years, I've been heralding teachers. Mm -hmm. They're the most underpaid yeah. assets in our society. Yeah. They yeah. certainly don't do it for the money. I don't right. know a teacher that doesn't get in their own pocket to come up with resources for the classroom and put in extra time. So God bless teachers, yes. uh, yes. seriously. Um, and I, I've spent a lot of time with them. I've, I've spoken to the organizations and all. But they know what they know, and they don't know what they don't know. And I'm aware of only a few teaching curriculums in preparing these teachers to be uniquely qualified to handle this sort of challenge, this sort of help for students. You can say they're the next best place to go, yet I'm not sure that is always the case. To, to confide in, you're right. Misinformation, giving the wrong information is worse than giving no information at all. And teachers not being trained is a bigger issue, right? That there needs to be some sort of training in place to help, you know, teachers and guidance counselors navigate this new era and what we're seeing right now. But you're absolutely right. Most teachers right now are not trained. But if they can't give advice, refer them to somebody okay. who can. I really am curious how you decide or they decide that they know better. I, I think about my own children who, thank God, are raised and uh, made it through and are both now fathers and, you know, have yeah. children of their own. But if, it, if a teacher had 
locked me out of a, a life-altering decision or whatever, I wouldn't have liked it, not even almost. It is ultimately so irresponsible to shut parents out. It is so difficult to take information like this to your parents because you don't want to disappoint them. Monday, I'm an American and I'm pissed off. The price of almost everything rising faster than in decades. I have to pay three, four, five times the price and then not get as much food. I just did a huge grocery haul. It was under $100. What is your recommended budget? This is a doable number. I think it's crazy. What you're doing is working, so I'm going to shut up. That's Monday. Then, on Tuesday... Danny was given a bottle of vodka taped to his hand. He was told to drink it. Finish it. Danny suffered massive brain damage, left blind, paralyzed, unable to communicate. That's Tuesday. Close cap. Well, I'm back with Jennifer, a mother who objects to not being included in the loop uh, when her daughter had declared to her school that she wanted to transition. Uh, Ushra, who's here and really advocates uh, for this not being uh, handled in the schools. Eli is here. Dr. Safai is here. We're talking about how transgender issues are handled in the school. We have the Parent Teacher Association and we have students engaged in those conversations because ultimately parents are the best indicator of a child's success in life. And for us to lock parents out of that equation, especially as Dr. Phil says, when teachers are not qualified on brain health issues, they are not trained on these issues that are so sensitive and so important. And so it is ultimately so irresponsible to shut parents out. Jennifer was so brave in being able to step forward like a mama bear for her child's personal self-interest because she has that child to tuck in at night, to, to see in through adulthood. Dr. Phil, I'm sure your kids are still coming to you for advice, right? Oh, you never get through parenting. Exactly. You just do it from a distance. Yeah. Exactly. But the not teachers but the teachers are gone. The parents, the parents aren't are trained gone. either. That's the issue. No, of course not. Right. That, that is the issue. Is like that, that's the whole issue. Standing. That's why I'm wanting to do this because I, I want to educate and inspire and train what do you want to say I, I feel like i'm hearing a lot of conversation right now about the parents and the parents feelings rather than about the children as a child that has been in in that position at some point in my life it is so difficult to take information like this to your parents right your mm -hmm. parents the last people you want to take that information to because you don't want to disappoint them yes and so for me, I think, you know, whilst the parents do need to be involved to a degree, yes, I don't think it needs to be from first contact, we need to relay this to the parents. We need to be giving these children an environment to experience this themselves first before it's taken to the parents. And encourage them to share it. The ultimate goal is to share it with the parents. Help them do that. We're so not actually it. locking parents out either. We are providing an opportunity for the child to choose whether they share relevant information or not. Say who you are. My name is Sherry. Okay. Um, I'm an Oregon parent and my concern with this is I understand that there's a comfort level when it comes to possibly telling your parents. There were things that I didn't want to tell my mother when I was young so I can understand that. However, I also know in regards to our school districts that teachers are mandatory reporters. And there's a difference between feeling uncomfortable going to your parents right. versus being harmed going to your parents. Mm -hmm. And when parents aren't involved and they have that other side, there can be so much that is missed. And so you are comfortable in your skin now, I'm assuming, as are you. But what about somebody who ends up making a change because it's not what meant for them and they're just confused and then they go down a road in these states where you can get um, medical uh, hormone therapy and puberty blockers at ages when you're not an adult yet we have you can't vote you there's age restrictions on voting driving buying alcohol firearms there's age restrictions on a lot of things there should be age restrictions on this may i add one thing to what Azra said mm -hmm. uh, Ezra, you talked about training, teachers being trained, and so forth. Well, I am a teacher, and I have a room full of students every year. 
They're not my daughters and sons. The gender confusion is a serious mental and emotional disturbance. It requires attention and family involvement. And to say that a child can decide any of this, all you have to do is go to YouTube and type in transition regret, and you will have thousands of young women who have removed their breasts and now regret it, and young men who've been castrated. And of course, <clears throat> none of these procedures will change someone's gender. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you from embarrassing yourself right there. Pure misinformation. Fewer than two no, percent of you. Misinformation, you and you it's don't right. need. Oh yeah, to. everything on the internet and, is true. Take it from me. And you don't um, need fewer to than two percent. Every major study has found that fewer than two percent of people who have received transition care read end more. up regretting it. Read more but studies. Also, I, I have. I've read thousands. Literally, yeah. I'm a researcher. I have yeah. read, read literally thousands of these studies. Well, it's actually so, between so two and two point five percent. But even those studies are kind of suspect because it's a very up. small end. And I should add that the um, regret rate for knee replacements, I believe it's like 15 to 25 percent. We should be hailing this as a miracle of modern medicine. So I think also, that, but we don't, but okay, we have on. to we, care we, about you, everyone. You might be surprised to hear what happened to Jennifer's daughter two years later because that plays right into this, maybe. And we'll talk about that and a lot more when we come back. I can't tell you how many people I've had say, oh, talk about this, but I'm going to talk about this, a national issue that every parent needs to pay attention to. The last thing he had to do to get into the fraternity was to drink a lot of alcohol. one, what is your emergency? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I resolved to find a way to make all of you an even bigger part of what we do here. I can think of no better way than to bring our studio audience right up here on stage. This is a cautionary tale. They were like, get on webcam with me right now, or I'm going to send this to literally everybody you know. Customers seem to be losing their cool at the drop of a hat. What the hell is going on? It is the number one issue on everyone's mind. I'm talking about inflation. Oh boy, are we going to talk about that? Now, Jennifer says that her daughter is really back to using she and her pronouns and has changed her position. What's happened? Well, um, we took her out of school. It was right before the pandemic and we did not trust the school uh, to be working in partnership with us anymore. So uh, we took her out um, and it, you know, everybody else was, had to be mandatory homeschooled shortly after that. So it really wasn't that big of a deal. But, um, and then she, uh, she had a falling out with her friend group who was all LGBTQ identified and they were 10 and 11. And, you know, there were some things that were said that concerned us and we took all of her devices away. So we removed her basically from all of the influences that were affirming her. <clears throat> and uh, slowly she let go of it over time and she desisted and became comfortable with herself as a girl again. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had discussions since then uh, about what happened. And I asked her, you know, what gave you the idea to go into the boys' cabin? And she said, that wasn't my idea. That was the teacher's idea. The teacher asked me. And I actually didn't want to be in the boys' cabin. I wanted to be with my friends, the girls. Um, but she didn't feel comfortable saying that to her teacher. She didn't trust him enough. She had already said she was a boy. Um, what was she supposed to say at this point that we, she, she probably figured she had to be, say yes to being in the boys' cabin. Um, you know, this teacher, I think he meant well, but he didn't realize that he was leading our daughter in a, in a particular direction. Looking at the timeline, your, your daughter broached these issues with you before the school situation ever came about. She did, yeah. I mean, she was, so... she would, she was I knew she was playing around with it. Mm -hmm. which seemed to me just kind of a normal part of development and, and yeah. exploring who you are. So, uh, and then the school situation happened and you took her out of school. Then there was this 
So I would really encourage you to let her find her own way mm -hmm. and see where she belongs. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, I do. Because, I haven't forced her in any direction. Yeah, because she, she kind of headed that way before and then the school situation then after school um it sounds to me that this last chapter hasn't been written and meet yeah, her I mean, meet her where she is and let her find her own way and i i think that'll be the healthiest course. place that you can meet her because who knows where you'll wind up because she's still very young that's true. She is still point. very young, and I don't know how she's going to identify as an adult. Yeah. What you um, know is you, you love her wherever she is and that's right. whatever she does, and the, the school didn't necessarily recognize that. Now, we actually have a statement from Jennifer's school, the district, and we're not identifying the school district or anything. The school district believes in fostering an educational environment that is safe and free of discrimination for all students regardless of gender expression, gender identity, or sex. So that's their blanket Wouldn't statement. Wouldn't that be your philosophy, too? Yes. Yeah. Now, before the show, one of our audience members revealed her granddaughter transitioned from male to female between first and second grade. I want to talk to her about that next. Well, I'm back, um, and we've been talking about this uh, an awful lot. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface. I have a grandmother here who has a granddaughter who, she says, transitioned uh, from male to female between the first and second grade. And she was able to use the female bathroom in the second grade, and it took a little time for everyone to be comfortable, she says. But now... No one has any issues, and she's 12 years old. Uh, second grade. So uh, actually, my granddaughter went to her parents at Christmas time, so first grade, and wanted to wear a dress, identified as a male at birth, wanted to wear a dress, and luckily my family said, well, let's try around our family and see how everybody feels. And so then that was fine everybody was you know surprised to see him in a dress but he was happier than i'd ever really seen him finished first grade as a as a boy and during the summer they really worked on it and luckily with the parent support they talked to the principal the principal talked to the teacher for second grade so she was brought in as a girl to second grade then after about a week or two, there was only one child that was instructed not to play with her, which was sad, but out of everybody, that was really good. But ideally, in this situation, I think going to the family first and then ha everybody working together, it would be wonderful. Right. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. We've run out of time today, and I feel like we've just scratched the surface on some important issues. So. Uh, when we were preparing this show, there were so many topics to cover, and I don't want to trivialize any of them. So I'm going to ask all of my guests and the audience to stick with me so we can continue this in another hour of conversation that we'll, uh, you will see very soon. So as for today, a special thanks to everyone that's here. Ashra Nomani, Dr. Yalda Safai, Eli Ehrlich, uh, for participating and this is I think been a very thoughtful conversation thank everybody for your contributions to this you know we need to really talk about these things and I think that's what moves things forward uh, it's it's not about trying to win an argument of who's right or wrong it's it's about trying to solve the problem and if if we can talk about these things without people judging each other uh, we can get to a better level of understanding. And that's what it's really all about. Everybody being included, everybody feeling safe, everybody having their own space to occupy. Uh, for more information about today's episode, log on to drphil.com where the conversation continues. And if you're in the Los Angeles area, and you, or you plan to be, we'd love to have you join us right up here on stage in our studio audience. The tickets are free. 
All you need to do is let us know when you can be here. Uh, just go to the website, drphil.com, click on Be Part of the Audience for all the details. And don't forget to follow and subscribe to my podcast, Fill in the Blanks. I talk about a lot of critical information on important issues that we're facing today, including this one. And check out Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret with Robin McGraw, where she swaps secrets and thoughts with thought leaders and innovators and really talks about some interesting uh, aspects of life. Really doesn't keep any secrets at all. Uh, listen for free on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll see you next time.